everyone, my name is Craig from Flying Wheels. Welcome to my Flying Wheels YouTube channel. Today is an extremely fun day because I am at a classic antique and muscle car auction. Now you may have already seen all the nice cars under that tent. All that stuff is super expensive and you have to have some serious cash to play in there. However, today's video is about affordable, realistic, fun toys at a dealer only auction. potatoes we are outside the tent this is the realistic stuff the affordable cars the stuff that you and I can buy on a daily basis have as a collector car take to car shows not worry too much about spending too much money and be able to enjoy the cars. So let's see what's outside the auction. Right here we have a 1980 Pontiac Trans Am with a 4.9 liter turbo. It's an Indianapolis Speedway edition. This is kind of a dog for a turbo V8. You'd expect a lot more and I've driven them and they're not that impressive. I still would prefer an 80 Trans Am with the standard V8. Behind us we have an old Maverick. Is that a Javelin? That's a Ford Maverick. An old F-150, a Camaro, a bunch of Mercedes. Here's a fun one though, check this out. This is a 73 Ford Mustang V8 convertible. I actually own this car as a Mach 1 Cobra Jet, not in a convertible. I bought it four years ago. It's been sitting in my garage, halfway restored for years and years because other projects keep getting in the way. But originally it was the same yellow. And the way you can tell the difference between a 71 2 and a 73 is this right here. These lenses right here are vertical versus horizontal. In 71 and 72, they were sideways. In 73, they're up and down. And the rocker stripe is different in 73 as well. This is one of my favorites of the outside auction. Check this out. This truck looks like a beater, but that's the idea. It's supposed to look like a beater. There's so much detail to this truck, starting with the gun rack. Check these out. That really adds to the effect of this rednecky feel, almost something that I'd see in a horror movie. But they did this intentionally. So a lot of times you can sand the body down and then spray salt and vinegar on the bare metal and it rusts up so you get that patina look and then you can clear over the rust to get the look that you see out there. Another feature that I enjoy is the Jägermeister shock glass glued to the hood as a hood ornament. And then they have the exhaust stacks coming out the side. Check those out right there. And the fuel tank in the back. This 56 Coupe de Ville Caddy would be unreal to drive to car shows or out with the family. Look at how big this is. And it's a coupe, meaning two door. Now this is kind of a beater. It's a project. I'm not interested in this because I have enough projects. You can still imagine driving this in the 50s as a successful businessman. This is pretty neat. We have a Tiki Tiki BMW Coupe. Rare to find these Z's in Coupe. Typically they're convertibles. Mater's back there. This is actually far cooler than you would think it is. This is a two-door Tahoe. Used to be a Blazer. Pretty neat to find these in two doors and they're getting more and more rare they're actually going up in value. You used to be able to buy these pretty cheap, but so many of them are rotted, rusty, and old and gone that it's hard to find a clean one. And this one's pretty clean. Now the difference between the Tahoe and the Blazer, the Blazer used to have a removable roof. I had talked about hideaway headlights in that 69 Camaro RSSS. These are hideaway headlights in a Lincoln. So they tuck up and under when you turn the headlights on. Now you don't really see Monte Carlo SS's anymore, but the coolest feature that I think this car has, check it out from the passenger seat. Ready for it? Does it have it? Does it have it? <laughs> yes, it does. This is an ashtray in the back of a seat, meaning the rear passengers were smoking in the back of the car in the 80s and dumping their ash out in the back of the seat. Imagine that. This is a 1967 Oldsmobile Tornado. And correct me if I'm wrong, I believe it's front wheel drive, which makes it one of the first American front wheel drive cars ever 
This was the test version to see if front wheel drive would work. We're gonna confirm that together. Come check this out. Yes, no rear differential, meaning there's nothing moving these rear wheels. They only roll. It's a front wheel drive vehicle from the 60s. All right, I told you I'd show you a Blazer. Well, here's a Blazer. Now we showed you the Tahoe. It is not a convertible. It is not a removable roof. The Blazer was, check this out. The roof weighs a ton and it's a lot of work to remove, but it is removable. And this glass rear window is a power window that slides into the tailgate. Whoa. Whoa. I actually didn't know it did this, so you're seeing it for the first time like me. So I thought it was a power window. It's a slide down crank window to an actual now truck tailgate. Wow, that's, and it weighs a ton. Fun fact about the 80s Thunderbird, it's also on the Fox body platform. So this is pretty similar to the Ford Mustang, supposed to be the better version as far as style and luxury. And you'll see what I mean by the center console gauges right there, more plush seating. This Fox body T-Bird is actually a pretty cool car. Now carried over, we have the Lincoln Continental, which is the upgrade in a four-door version of that T-Bird. Typically, the Lincoln Continentals were gigantic, especially in the 60s and 70s. They started shortening everything up, so this is a much shorter rear end. And you can fit a lot less bodies in the trunk. We have a flare side Chevy, an Avanti, old Benz, and there's some cool stuff over here that I saw in the shadows last night that I'd like to go check out. This is a 75 Pontiac Granville Donker. I'm not sure if that's a derogatory term. I think they're actually called Donkers when they look like this. Check out this car. If I'm not supposed to say that, I apologize, but I think that's what these are called. That's for Chevy Camaro Z28. Is it a five speed? Bummer, it's an automatic, but it is super clean and says it has 28,000 miles. It could be 28,000 miles because it has a five digit odometer, but based on the condition of the dash, the seats and the carpet, this looks like an actual 28,000 mile car, especially since you can see the window sills here and how the door shut. All right, so I showed you the full size Blazer outside with the removable roof. Well, this is a smaller version of the Chevy Blazer, right? Wrong. Wait a minute, check this out. I tried to explain the differences between the Tahoe and the Blazers, but now the Mini Blazer has Tahoe on it. Boom, Tahoe, which is weird to me. It's the first time I've ever seen that, and it kind of throws everything off, but it's an S10 Blazer, S10 chassis. Last one that I want to show you, one of my favorites of the day, not that nice, but still super cool, is this old Suburban. Check this thing out. It's rough, it's ugly, but there's more to it than meets the eye. Now this is around an 85, 86, 87 Chevy Silverado Suburban. The Chevy Silverado was identical to this right here with the bench seat, but what you're getting in the Suburban, obviously, as you know, are instead of the truck bed, full bench here, full bench in the third, storage in the rear. So they turn the truck bed into an actual SUV for the family. Now they started doing this decades before even this car. That's not what makes this thing so cool. This is what makes this Suburban, so cool. Somebody chopped the back of a Suburban like this, which is already hard to find, and turned it into a trailer to tow behind their Suburban. By far the smallest car I've ever seen on the road. You have to check out this 1981 freeway. And from the High Mileage Vehicles Company in 1981 in St. Cloud, Minnesota. Single passenger gets up to 900 miles on a tank and a guaranteed 100 miles per gallon. This thing's tiny, single passenger made completely out of fiberglass. Look how long it is. Just a little bit longer than myself. 12 inch wheels come around to the trunk. So it is equipped with the trunk. Again, you can see the entire car is made out of fiberglass sunroof the window doesn't go down so you have your window vent right here that actually pops in and out and surprisingly there's plenty of headroom 
and it has an 80 mile an hour odometer, which I wonder if that's true. The problem is, the entire thing is made out of fiberglass. So if you are ever in an accident, you are gonna be in as bad a shape as the car. Now it says 80 miles an hour. Imagine going 80 miles an hour on the highway with this thing. I have no idea what this is worth, so this is definitely gonna be one of the cars that we wanna check out and see what it sells for. I don't know, three grand? I, I couldn't even put a number on it, I couldn't even guess, so we'll have to see this one later on. Here we have a 77 Chevy C10, which is actually more difficult than it sounds to say. Come check this one out. 67 Camaro SS 350. This is the first year of the Chevy Camaro. Came out in 1967. And then we have what could potentially be our Ferrari Flip. We're not there for our budget yet, but the idea of this car is pretty close to what I'm aiming for. I'm expecting to get 60 to 70 thousand on it. Blue's not really my color. Yellow or red is what I'd go for. You can't go for yellow. Rizzy's the color. Yo, shit is yellow, B. Rizzy's the color. If you're my age, you know what movie that's from. I'm as much of a fan of Italian sports cars as the next guy. This Ferrari is a beautiful car. And if you can't afford a Ferrari, your next step down is a Maserati. But I'm gonna show you why right here. You shouldn't buy a Maserati for so many reasons. Come follow me. So this right here is a 2007 Maserati Quattro Porte. Now it's 14 years old, running up on 15 years old. It is an aged, dated car. And even with 56,000 miles, there is a lot you have to watch out for. Now, if you can't afford a Ferrari, you might think, hey, I want a Maserati. A lot of them actually have the same drivetrain. I had an 04 Maserati that was unbelievable. It sounded unreal. It shifted like a Ferrari should shift. The problem was the maintenance. And let me show you what I mean. So this car is getting dated. Like I said, it's 14 years old. And when you can't afford a Ferrari, but you want a Ferrari, you go over to Maserati. Now the problem is Maserati has Maserati repair price tags, which gets really, really costly, which also means they get neglected. So if you own a Ferrari, typically you can afford the repair costs. If you own a Maserati, you're a lot more likely to neglect or push off those repairs. This is what I'm talking about. This is actually a nice set of Maserati wheels, but you can see these tires are completely worn down and dry rotted. And if people are neglecting their tires, how much are they neglecting their cars? This right here shares a very similar F1 style transmission as that Ferrari 360 over there. You can see the paddle shifters here and it's forward and reverse for gears. It's that simple. Now you actually leave it in the middle to be in neutral. There's no park. This is your park. Your parking brake is to put the car in park. The problem is these are really high maintenance transmissions. You need to service the clutches regularly and it's very expensive. So if you're ever buying these cars with this type of transmission, you need to make sure the clutches have been serviced with receipts, but not a lot of people do that, which is what brings the value down so much on these cars. Now with that in mind, the values are so low so often because they've been neglected and people don't wanna put the money into the repairs. Now let me tell you something. The most expensive Maserati is a cheap Maserati. Think about that. Now I'm gonna show you a couple other things. Right here, the Maseratis are coated in a rubber coating. So if you see right here, it's all scratched up here and here. Actually, this is like body filth stuck on because it's all rubber that has become sticky over the years and I could actually dig my finger into it to make a mark. You can see the emblems have started to come off too. This only has 55,000 miles and it's in rough shape and it's not the car. It's every Quattro Porte that I've seen. There was one at my auction recently that was in the same exact condition. You can see the mirror buttons have broken off already. You can see by the door handle all the scratches. The leather's in pretty good shape, but for 55,000 miles, I don't think it should be cracking already. And then even going over to the owner's manual. The owner's manual should be in the glove box and it looks like it's been chewed up by a dog. This looks like an owner's manual I'd find in a car from the 80s. There's no way it should be worn out like that. Now, if Maserati's making their owner's manual out of this material, what are they putting into their vehicles? And just another example, if you look right here, I actually have to, my, my fingers are sticky just from touching this. And that isn't something that somebody put on the car. That's a factory coating that's worn over the years. Now these cars are fun to drive. They sound amazing. I had a Maserati with a wide open exhaust that was unreal. And that's the 
the positive factor. That's why you want these cars. They're an absolute blast to drive. If you look at the Gran Turismo, it's a reasonably priced supercar. You can get them between thirty-five and sixty thousand dollars, and even in a convertible, you get that Ferrari look, the amazing sound. You just have to make sure you're up to date on the maintenance. Now, this car is going through the auction today. I'm thinking it's going to be like seven thousand to eight thousand dollars, which is really appealing. It really makes you want to buy a Maserati. The problem is not the seven or eight thousand dollars. It's what's going to follow up with repairs later on when this car breaks. Now remember, the most expensive Maserati is a cheap Maserati. Old Mercedes SL 600. Nothing special, right? Wrong. V12 under this hood, and there's two of them here today. This right here is a 1970 Chevy Chevelle SS 396. Absolutely one of the most iconic muscle cars in the history of muscle cars. And there's so many cool factors that I'm gonna show you about this car, but not only am I gonna show you the cool factors, we're at a dealer only muscle car auction. So we get to see what this thing is actually gonna sell for. Now the market is at a premium right now. I don't know if this is gonna be outrageous or realistic. So both of us get to find out at the same time. But let me show you why this Chevelle SS is so special. Now there are a lot of subtle differences from 1969 to 1970 and 1971, which is what makes the 1970 so desirable. The headlights were different in 1969, 70, and 71, as well as the taillights. Now this is how you can decipher the three, is the headlights and the taillights right from the beginning. Now it had a 350 V8 and then the optional 396 and 454 engines. The 396 tends to be the most desirable engine. The 454 is a giant engine in this car. Father's friend had one in high school that claims could do wheelie. Now this is a factory four speed with a Hurst shifter. You can see it has the, the AM FM radio. It even has a factory air conditioning. Now the problem with cars like this is there's no brain to it. It's all muscle. I mean, even the seats, there's nothing holding you in. It's just a pretty bouncy seat, but going side to side, there's nothing keeping you in like today's technology. Now one last cool thing about the Chevy Chevelle SS, let me show you, is the iconic cowl induction hood. So yes, we have a cowl hood right here that you might see on Camaros and everything, but this right here actually flips up and sucks the air in to cool the engine. And then lastly, we have the iconic hood pins. Don't forget to pin your hood pins because you don't want this flying up on the highway. And this right here is as utilitarian as it gets. This is a 72 Jeep. These are the Jeeps that used to flip over on the highway that makes all the moms scared about you owning a Jeep Wrangler today. By the way, they don't flip over anymore. Okay, so tomorrow in part two, we're actually gonna see what these cars sell for. Now I wanna know, are these inexpensive antique classic and muscle cars at a dealer auction less expensive than you could buy them to the public? I don't know, and we're gonna find out together in our next episode. So make sure to subscribe down below and hit the little bell to get notified for when the next video comes out. And you can follow our day to day because I make smaller videos and photos on our Instagram, TikTok, and Facebook. For now, I'll see you all later. Have a great day.